So good afternoon again. Uh, I hope you are all enjoying your lunch and we ask you to, to please continue to do so. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, our, keynote, uh, our keynote speaker. So it's my honor to introduce Ambassador George Moose, currently serving as the Vice Chairman Board of Directors here at USIP. Uh, a little bit about Ambassador Moose. He's a career member of the U.S. Foreign Service, where he attained the rank of Career Ambassador. His service with the U.S. State Department included assignments in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and Europe. He's held appointments as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Benin, Senegal, and from 1991 to 1992, he was U.S. Alternate Representative to the United Nations Security Council. In 1993, he was appointed Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, a position he held until August of 97. From 1998 to 2001, he was a U.S. Permanent Representative to the European Office of the United Nations in Geneva. And in June 2007, he was appointed by the White House to the Board of Directors of the U.S. Institute of Peace, where he now serves, as I mentioned, the Vice Chair. Please welcome, help me welcome Ambassador George Moose. Thanks, Thanks very much, Jim. And uh, as the Vice Chair of the Board of the U.S. Institute of Peace, it's uh, a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome all of you to this important uh, workshop. Um, we here at the Institute have had a long history of involvement with the United Nations in particular in, in an effort to bring our learning and our experience to bear on the enormous challenges that the United Nations faces and no greater challenge than the challenge of peace operations. Um, as your conversations this morning have helped to reveal, the landscape of peacekeeping has never been more complex or more challenging. Um, and with Under Secretary General Natsu this morning, meeting with uh, our President Nancy Lindbergh, we were uh, cataloging the different situations where the UN has been called upon to play a critical role um, in maintaining peace, but going well beyond that um, in finding ways to protect civilians in trying to promote uh, human rights, in trying to encourage good governance, in dealing with issues of, uh, of institutional incapacity. But increasingly having to do that not only in permissive environments, but having to do it in, in some of the most difficult and dangerous places in the world. And having to adapt its operations, its policies to those situations. Um, needless to say, that makes the challenges of communicating even more difficult. The number of constituencies, internal as well as external, who have to understand the mission, understand what the UN is there to accomplish and to achieve, and hopefully to be a part of that effort in achieving success. So we've had this morning conversations about the, uh, if you will, the conceptual framework for <laughs> strategic communication, but that all needs to be informed by some practical realities, and I can't think of anybody better to help us understand those practical realities than the current Under Secretary General for, for Peace Operations at the United Nations, Ambassador Eve Latsu uh, has headed the Department of Peacekeeping since uh, October 2011. But he comes to that job with a wealth of experience, um, primarily in the French Foreign Service, um, having served in a, a number of positions in the French Foreign Ministry, uh, in Asia particularly, but also as the Deputy Permanent Representative of France in the United Nations Office uh, at the UN in New York. Uh, and more recently as the permanent representative of France to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vienna. Um, 
experience in some of those areas where UN has been called upon to play peacekeeping roles, such as in Indonesia and Timor-Leste. And more recently, as uh, France's um, ambassador to the People's Republic of China. So he brings to this job just uh, an enormous range of both practical and diplomatic experience. We were talking specifically about the role he played as the spokesman for uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in France and agreed that of all of the missions <laughs> that a diplomat is called upon to play, that is perhaps the most difficult and challenging. And therefore, he comes with that experience uh, with particular appreciation for the importance of communication and strategic communication. So it's my, um, we, we are honored to have him here today. It, 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 I think, only validates the importance of the subject of this conference. Um, and so it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium uh, Under Secretary General uh, Hervé Latsu. And please join me in welcoming him. Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for those kind words, Mr. Ambassador. And indeed, it is also for me a great privilege to be able to address you today under these uh, circumstances where we just had the report of the review panel uh, coming out last week, and this is going to inform our work over uh, coming weeks and months. But thank, firstly, I would like to thank the United States Institute of Peace and the Folk Bernadette, Bernadotte Academy for organizing this very important meeting today. Uh, so, let me perhaps jump straight into the matter and say, describe to you very briefly how critical the juncture is that we are entering for UN peacekeeping. Because our work no longer is about manning static positions overlooking ceasefire lines. It is no longer only about monitoring the uh, implementation of a peace agreement that has been signed between well-defined parties. Today, peacekeeping is about military and civilian peace peacekeepers working together to protect civilians, to strengthen national security forces, to strengthen political institutions, to disarm and to demobilize combatants. It is about creating a climate of trust that would reduce the levels of violence create space for reconciliation and peace processes to take hold, ultimately to allow for peace agreements to be signed. It is also about being prepared to use force when necessary, about being prepared certainly to defend against attacks. So the conflicts that we are addressing today mostly are within, not between states. They involve frequently competing modes of governance and protection, between the state and the armed groups that have often taken control of various areas of the country. In some places, such as in the Sahel, the interests of some parties are increasingly linked with transnational crime. New asymmetric tactics, suicide bombs, IEDs, are now being used by armed actors in some areas where we operate. And in Mali, indeed, we have become the target of such attacks. So, it is a change in nature, and I think it has created new security and political challenges. Let me go first through the security challenges. The threats have evolved. The level of equipment and military training of those who refuse to give up to peace are evolving constantly. Attacks are more complex. Equipment is more sophisticated. And the UN, as I said already, is more often than not directly targeted. So there is a wearing increase in the use of asymmetric warfare. And Mali is the best illustration for that, to also ranging to the use of civilians as a tool of war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In Mali, 
and I think it is important to note that the review panel has highlighted this, maybe uh, in part that is my responsibility, but it is very clear that UN peacekeeping is not and will not be a tool for fighting terrorism. We are not equipped, we are not designed, and we shall not do that. But at the same time, the terrorists are operating, they are fighting us, and indeed, the number of casualties over the past year sadly reflects this. Regarding the political challenges, there is, I think, one major one which has come to our mind over the last year or so, even though it's been there for some time, that is the non-compliance by host government to the Security Council mandates. This can take the form of restrictions of movement, it can be physical, moral harassment, PNGing of uh, even sometimes very senior personnel, uh, detainment of our equipment at the customs, and more generally, non-cooperative behavior. And you know what I'm referring to. It's about South Sudan, it's about Sudan, it's about the DRC, for instance. It is just not possible to work in a more unstable security situation and at the same time to have to fight, to oppose, to push back the non-cooperation of the host government. So I have launched the idea that maybe we should look at the possibility of compact between the Security Council and the host government. And so far, the membership has been rather receptive to that idea. And again, it is an idea that the panel has taken up, so, uh, because it does mention it positively, and I think there might be some mileage in this, and I can confide in you that we'll probably try to apply it experimentally in the case of the Central African Republic, because conditions might be just about right for that. <coughs> I apologize, I got a bad cold traveling a few days ago. So, facing these new challenges, Security Council has mandated us with increasingly complex and challenging mandates. We do have nowadays 125,000 military, police and civilians in 16 operations around the world, and that's more than ever before. So, in all these areas, from the Golan Heights to the DRC, from CAR to Haiti, we have to undertake a broad array of tasks in very diverse environments. The expectations of the Council vis-à-vis -vis us have grown tremendously. First, of course, we are expected to protect civilians from conflict. That is the core of our mandates nowadays. But also, we do have a number of what we call multidimensional functions supporting stabilization, supporting the extension of the authority of the state, strengthening the rule of law, addressing gender equality, inequality, protecting human rights, obviously, to mention just a few. So, in order to prepare our peacekeepers to, to rise to the challenge of uh, uh, what we face today has been, in my almost four years on the job, a very important personal priority. My focus has been on enhancing performance, and this particular year, perhaps more than any before. It's about modernizing, it's about professionalizing, it's about standardizing peacekeeping, creating systems that ensure that we are constantly adapting and incorporating new tools and best practices. And I'll just mention four ways in which we are doing this. The creation, upon my request two years ago by the General Assembly, of the Office for Peacekeeping Strategic Partnership. Sorry, that's UN speak, but actually I always refer it to as the Inspector General, because that is what it's about, uh, led by, in fact, a three-star three general. This is a tool to identify gaps, opportunities, and lessons that we can learn that have an impact on the delivery of mandates for uni by uniformed personnel. So there are periodic reviews of our operations, both on the, on the ground, also in headquarters, and to make the adjustments where needed, the whole goal being to make our operations more nimble, leaner, more responsive as the needs evolve on the ground. For instance, in Yunamid, in Darfur, 
we discovered that there was a whole bunch of prison wardens. I know you're supposed, politically correct speaking, to be to say correction officers, but prison wardens they are. The fact is that we had a whole bunch of them in El Fasher, but they never had any access to prisons, no other likely to have. So obviously the whole team had to pack, you know, and uh, we recalled them. It's a sort of concrete element, you know, that are just common sense. So uh, we have adapted. A second uh, element is that we have to ensure that our people possess the capabilities that are necessary to implement the mandates. They need to be prepared to respond to major changes in the security situation at short notice. And this was the case 18 months ago, if you remember, in South Sudan in December 13. This, of course, requires us to have very robust, very mobile capabilities and reserve capabilities to change sometimes, and in the particular case of South Sudan, radically our posture. And, of course, being able to counter the use of asymmetric tactics, of psychological operations, uh, all that requires a better access to intelligence, it requires timely threat assessments, it requires more sophisticated uh, technology. And these three areas are high priority to me, technology and intelligence in particular. So to respond to all these needs with our brothers in uh, field support, we have created the Uniform Capabilities Development Agenda and identified eight priority areas for which we need to develop to improve our performance. So eight work streams, which range from existing or emerging challenges, will guide our efforts. Ultimately, the goal remaining to make our peacekeepers more fit for purpose in this uh, increasingly non-permissive and dangerous environment. Third, for peacekeeping to be effective in the 21st century, we must have access to 21st century tools. And this brings me back to the subject of technology. The symbol of that has been the use that we pioneered of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, surveillance drones, surveillance exclusively, of course, in the DRC. And since we've had them, they've had not only uh, made a tremendous difference in the way we work, but also it has actually contributed greatly to the better protection of the civilians and, of course, to the better protection of our people. And now that it's been a good experience, uh, actually this has launched a whole process uh, to reflect on the use of technology and innovation. And we had a rather remarkable report on this last winter, which we are implementing because there are great recommendations to capitalize on those new technologies. It's about communications, data analysis, uh, greening the blue, although, as we say, that's uh, greening our technology. And so we are working to do that. Fourth, it's also about effective performance and therefore the need to attract new uh, high-performing contributors to peacekeeping and retain our most effective troop and police contributing countries at the same time. Uh, we have had a long-standing relationship with uh, member states on their contributions, but maybe we have lacked a more strategic approach that would provide coherence to our outreach with existing and potential troop and police contributors. And this is why we have recently established a strategic force generation and capabilities planning cell, which is designed to be an interface for strategic engagement with member states over the longer term. And we continue to work on this, and I must say that the forthcoming peacekeeping summit this September will be a unique opportunity to push that further and translate it into actually uh, reality. And I'm very grateful to the United States for the support at the highest level that they were bringing us, they are bringing us to help achieve this. And we continually prospect for new contributors I was uh, 10 days ago in Vietnam to talk to uh, that government, which is for the first time ever starting to contribute uh, modestly, of course, but these are uh, potential contributions that we must 
continue to encourage. So these are the big actions that we are undertaking to improve the overall performance of peacekeeping. We pledge to do our best to ensure that uniformed personnel have what they need to perform to the maximum of their abilities. But of course, those countries have to fulfill their side of the bargain. They have to make sure that their people, their women and men, are adequately trained. They are well equipped. They are prepared for deployment to our operations. So a lot of work to continue to be done about pre-deployment training, including about protection of civilians, about sexual and gender-based violence, about child protection. It also means that they have to be fully aware that accountability will take place for anything that deviates from the integrity we expect of our peacekeepers. So to come back to the central reason of today's meeting, <coughs> it is obvious that in this very new landscape, effective communications is a priority more than ever for strategic peacekeeping. We have to communicate strategically to the local people, to the parties in conflict, to the regional actors, to other international actors and partners on the ground. All that has to be a critical component of an effective political strategy. We need support of the key audiences to succeed because it is not by force alone that we will win. It's by conquering the uh, souls and the minds, conquérir les âmes et les cœurs, that is what's about, and communication is the only thing that can achieve that. Of course, I have to say, you have, we have seen recently very negative press stories that make allegations of inefficiency or sometimes malfeasance. And it is true that reputation and awareness are as important an asset as armored vehicles. Rumors, misperceptions can have actually real security implications on the ground. So that calls for really targeted external relations initiatives and campaigns in the context into which we are now asked to build, to maintain support. So effective strategic communication does build support with key partners, with key stakeholders. It should dispel misconceptions. It should provide situational awareness that helps us also to protect better civilians as well as own personnel. Without an adequate strategic communications capability, these key constituencies can actually become spoilers and misconception and misinformation can also undo months of solid operational work on the ground. This is why development of a tailored and dynamic communication strategy based not on a monologue but on dialogue is critical. And there again, as in the field of technology, we cannot do 21st century peace operations with the tools of the past century and this applies particularly to communications. We need to adapt to modern techniques and technologies and we have to make sure that our people, our staff are trained adequately to handle this. The best information comes from communities themselves and this is of course essential to understand better the needs of the people that we are there to serve to convey also the limits of UN capabilities to manage the expectations and in times of crisis to maximize the support of response not only on the ground but also at the level of the Security Council. As you are aware, the Peace Panel's review report actually includes strong and concrete proposals on strategic communications and I support those recommendations, especially the one that the UN's public information approach has to be more dynamic, has to embrace modern communications methods that will help us remain relevant in a fast-moving world. Now, Nick, this is not a reflection on your work, quite the contrary. I value that. I value your contribution. 
but it's true that it's a constant effort to modernize. Uh, you know, when we look at the operations on the ground, it is maybe not very well known, but in the DRC, it is the UN that runs the biggest radio operation in the country, Radio Capi, which is considered universally popular, trustworthy to the population. Unfortunately, lately, the government has been less convinced to that and has been trying to force us to, if not close it, at least to curtail it. I remember the foreign minister when I was asked there uh, six weeks ago telling me, and you should discontinue this um, show, which is one of dialogue with people on the phone. That is absolutely not in line with legislation. So I listened to him and going out of his office, I told my people, okay, I'm going to do that show tomorrow morning. And well, I think that's a good messaging. <laughs> so we have to continue doing that. We have now radios also in Mali, Radio Mikado, that do all this outreach work. Uh, we have established recently one also in the CAR, Radio Geira, which is the name of the tree under which people gather in the villages to discuss uh, situations. And all this is um, really, I think, uh, doing part of the job. At the same time, I think we have also to change to the extent possible the culture of the people. And I took the initiative two years ago as we were having our yearly meeting of the force commanders, we just had this year's last week. I insisted on building a segment into that week of work to give them, our generals, a bit of media training. I don't know in other armies, but in the one I know best, La Grande Muette says it all, the great mute, military don't usually speak to media. But I think in our operations it's very different and actually under the authority of the SRSG, obviously, but I think uh, they have to communicate. They have a number of messages to spread and it's happening gradually. So this is just another attempt, again, to give a different culture to our people. So this is what it's about. Of course, being here in this uh, great capital city, I should also mention that uh, we are mindful of financial constraints, that we continue to take steps to reduce the cost of peacekeeping. And in fact, it is true that we are doing more, more than less, uh, more with less. Do you know that there is only one internationally deployed armed force in the world that has over the last five years achieved a reduction in cost per head by 16% in real terms? I think no army can boast of that, but we have done it. But there is a limit to what can be cut. And of course, as we need to deploy more equipment, uh, more sophisticated uh, protection, uh, counter IED, uh, counter battery radars, other UAVs, mine protected vehicles. I think we also continue, we need to continue to receive adequate financial support from member states. So this is where we are, ladies and gentlemen. This is what we do, but we are, I think, all working hard. We try to make peacekeeping better every day. There's still lots of things to do, but I think with the support of the membership, with your support, we can actually make further progress. So thank you very much for your attention. Sure, sure, yeah, I, see, I, I always enjoyed the question and answer part even better, but uh, Under Secretary General uh, Lanzu does have uh, some other commitments in this afternoon, but he does have maybe a couple of minutes, five minutes, and I know we have some extremely knowledgeable people in the room and with Kautsky from, from the Department of Defense, Tori Holt from, uh, from the State Department, but this is your opportunity. so. Perhaps I might just start by asking what, um, what you would wish most to see come out of the process that's now been launched, the high-level panel. You've had an enormous opportunity now in September. Mm -hmm. 
with um, presumably the presentation of a report to the General Assembly. Yeah. Um, do you, what's your vision of how this process might unfold over the next few months? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. I think the expectation is that, uh, you know, peacekeeping has long been a partnership. It's a partnership between our governing body, the Security Council, the Secretariat, and the community of contributors of troop and police. And this has to be constantly nurtured and fed. And I think by the fact that this review has actually re-highlighted uh, the issues, I think it can bring forward the rejuvenation of the partnership. It also brings, back, brings us, and this is also to be one of the major virtues of that peacekeeping summit we're going to have in September, bringing in either a renewed commitment or new commitments from contributors. And indeed, we've seen a sprouting of countries, you know, who come to me and say, well, we're interested. Usually, I have to say, every year, I receive four or five visits by ambassadors whose country is running for the Security Council non-permanent seat, you know, in the autumn. And usually they come to see me sometimes in the preceding winter and say, oh, by the way, could we do something for you, you know? So sometimes it's uh, modest, sometimes it's not so modest. That's all, uh, always welcome. But now we have seen a spate of countries new to peacekeeping who, because they got the message, uh, the political message, because also the end of the operations in Afghanistan, and that applies particularly to NATO and EU countries, because Afghanistan has come to an end for them, then they have capacities that they're ready to bring back, or to bring for the first time to UN peacekeeping. So this, it's all a sort of uh, coming together of uh, new trends that are absolutely welcome, and I'm grateful to all those who are making that possible. Tore, you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, you've already mentioned the summit, but perhaps you could share with us <coughs> some of the capabilities that you think the UN has in short supply, given the breadth and depth of missions that range from some of the challenges in places like Mali, but <coughs> there's also missions where it's truly post-conflict and we're seeing a transition back to uh, the capacities of the government. So you have a broad sweep of potential capacities that the UN needs for this range of missions. And also I would ask if there's anything in the high level panel that you think <coughs> should just move forward that you would recognize. I, I note that it mentions rapid deployment, useful analysis, there's a number of tools. And while it's never easy to, um, I'm sure if there was a review of the State Department, we'd feel a little funny about it, but um, giving you the opportunity to maybe highlight some of the reforms, if you've had a chance to see the panel report that you'd bring to our attention. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's true that we have uh, worked a lot on looking at what it is that we need and what it is that we require from member states. And it's true that uh, it means uh, all sorts of initiatives, you know, to either strengthen our cooperation bilaterally with member states or encourage triangular cooperation, you know, the examples that the U.S. have been giving, you know, in uh, this program called APREP to help uh, six African countries, you know, to be better prepared to come into our operations. And Japan is doing the same right now by training some uh, African uh, military engineering uh, forces, uh, uh, training and equipping them. So I think that goes all in the same uh, positive uh, direction. So really, we have to continue on that way. But uh, thank you, Victoria, for your support of your government. Thank you. Very good. Let me, and on behalf of all of us here, thank uh, Under Secretary General Natsu for his presence. Thank you. But uh, even more for his contribution to our, our reflection today on, on peace operations broadly, but important within that framework, the increasing importance of our ability to communicate to all concerned what it is we're about and what we're trying to do, uh, absent which we 
will not succeed in our missions. And so thank you again for joining thank us today. Thank you. Thank you.